Hi everyone, this is Pastor Kevin with Rock Harbor Church, and yes, I'm coming to you online this week for a new message series. So Tuesday night, we had our first ever council meeting, bringing together a wise, a wise council of men and women to prayerfully and biblically lead our church as we take these steps of becoming a new church. But things have changed a lot around our entire world just in the past few days. And honestly, a lot of people have said they've never seen something quite like it. Well, we are going to continue the blessed series that we've been doing because we want to bless people to Jesus, not convert people to Christianity. But at the same time, as we do that at the beach, in fact, tomorrow morning, we're going to be at Spessor Holland South, and we'll be gathering for about a 30-minute time of uh, worship, scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and to see how God has called us to bless people towards Jesus, not convert people to Christianity. So we will be continuing that tomorrow morning, and if you are able to come and that's a place that you feel safe to be we are going to be outdoors and not shaking hands and enjoying that time but here online i'm going to bring to you this message series that i think is incredibly powerful called the counselor that's been given to us by our friends at life church and so i'm going to let you see their awesome opening video to give us a different perspective on this amazing story from jesus why don't you tell me what happened i was with jesus all day. So we get on a boat to cross the lake and, you know, more boats come too. I guess they were all so caught up in following him that they didn't even see it coming. See what coming? That storm last night. I have never been on the lake in a storm like that. And there Jesus is, in the stern, laying down, oh, fast asleep. Oh, we woke him up. We asked him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? How did he answer? He shouted at the storm, Quiet! Be still! And, and get this, just the wind just stopped. The lake completely flat. How did that make you feel? That part was awesome. But then he turned to us. He looked me right in the eye and he said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I just love the way that that story is told because it seems more real to me maybe than when we read the scripture sometimes, which we are going to do here as well. You know, as we look at this idea of uh, what is it that God is calling us to when he asks us these questions, that he allows us to just get a counselor, uh, gets more out of you, he's getting more out of us. I will tell you, I have been to counseling. Um, I've been to counseling on my own. And I've been to counseling with my wife, and both was extremely needed. Uh, I tell people counseling can be much more like changing your oil than replacing an engine. So many times we, we go during the really difficult times, and I've had those conversations with a counselor. Um, but how much better to come to a place where maybe you're not so defensive and you are more open. And when you go to a counselor, the one thing that is so interesting is you go there and you're paying them typically a good amount of money. And yet... I want to go and ask them questions and have them give me the answers. But what happens is many times they're asking you questions and they're trying to get you to answer the questions, not just to show them who you are, but really to show yourself who you are. And these really good questions can allow you to realize so much. In fact, for me in my life, uh, probably more effective than the counselor was my accountability partner when I did my 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery. When I went through that, they helped me begin a journey of healing by allowing myself to really realize who I am and how I can put myself above others in unhealthy ways and want to get what I want to get. When I was told to really be honest and answer these questions, I could see that there was an underlying sickness that was driving me to make poor decisions, and it was able to redirect me to go towards a path of more health. You see, it was a good question that helped me find the answer that uh, they weren't giving me the answer, but they were able to allow God to kind of direct me towards that answer. What's really interesting about the Gospels, the, the books of the Bible that tells the life of Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is Jesus is asking question after question after question. In fact, you can barely even read a, a, a conversation with Jesus that he's not asking a person this question that, completely changes their entire life. In fact, he asked well over a hundred recorded questions in the Gospels. 
And as much as I would love to look at every single question I think I have over time, we're going to look at four questions together. And so in the upcoming weeks, we're going to look at these four questions. Today, we're going to ask this basic, basic question of, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Gosh, what a great question for today, because there's so many of us that are just feeling afraid with everything that's happening around us. Uh, but then next week, we're going to go into another really deep question. Do you believe I can do this? Maybe you're in need of a miracle. Uh, maybe your life, maybe your health, maybe your marriage is in need of a miracle. And do you believe that God, that Jesus can actually do this miracle? The third week, we're going to really try to challenge. Maybe you're a person who has that hurt habit or hangup. Maybe a physical problem that you cannot overcome. Maybe a reoccurring sin. And Jesus asked this really powerful question. Uh, do you want to be well? And then week four, we're going to go into this question as that's going to be the week of Palm Sunday. Now, we may be back in Gemini on week four. I'm still going to finish this online series because I think that this is going to be a powerful teaching in itself. Um, but regardless, on Palm Sunday weekend, we're going to ask this question of why do you doubt? Like, why do we doubt that Jesus is the one that came and that he was the Messiah who died for our sins? Um, I believe in modern church today, um, this is one of the least talked about subjects, but we live in a world that is doubting more and more. And so we're going to really kind of dive into that question a little bit more. Today, though, let me give you a context of where we're going to be. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 4. And so if you have a Bible that you want to grab, what's great, you can hit pause on me and go get your Bible or get your Bible app. And it's going to be really helpful to have Mark chapter 4 in front of you. So Jesus was actually teaching from a boat. And so he's going to be in this boat in this teaching. And, and what he's doing from this time is, he got on his boat to kind of get off from the crowd a little bit, to give himself a little bit of distance. We know uh, sound travels on the water, so I assume Jesus knew that. So he goes and he gets on a boat, and he goes a little bit off, and he gives another teaching. But then at the end of the teaching, he tells his disciples, let's leave the crowd and go to the other side. And he's on the Sea of Galilee. So this isn't like you know the ocean, but this is still a large body of water that was surrounded by mountains. So they get on the boat, which is kind of his pulpit, and he goes to the other side, or they're going to travel to the other side, and his boat, which was his pulpit, is now going to become a great sermon illustration, this true event. This is not a parable. This is an event that actually did happen that's recorded in the Gospels, and we're going to see this in Mark chapter 4. If you want to look at verse, verse uh, 35, we're going to do 35 through 41. And we're going to break it down for you so that you can see this a little bit. And I'm going to try and pull the scripture up here uh, as well to kind of go with us. All right. So verse 35, that day when the evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind him, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. We don't really talk much about that, but what a fun thing that we could get into. All right, verse 7 says this. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped or capsized or, or, or sinking. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you've been in a place where you were on a boat and you were trying to get back into the Sebastian Inlet. Or actually, in my life, there was a time that we were trying to get a boat into a harbor from Lake Erie. And that's up like north of Ohio, and it's a pretty small lake compared to some of the other Great Lakes, and especially an ocean, but kind of like the Sea of Galilee, you can still get big waves and big storms. Well, in my situation, we actually had to stay out into the body of Lake Erie because it was safer for us to go up and down than it was for us to try and come in past the rocks, very similar to the Sebastian Inlet that we have uh, close here to Rock Harbor and Melbourne Beach. Uh, maybe for you, what you've experienced is the airplane. When all of a sudden that turbulence comes in, it's like the airplane just drops. And, you know, you hear stories of airplanes dropping 100 feet, you know, and all of a sudden just they're, they're going around super fast and bam, they drop down because the pressure changes on the airplane. You feel that shake or the airplane go up and down. And uh, you actually have those thoughts in your mind like, this is it. Like, this is it. Like, this is the end. This is massive panic, like we're going down, and that's what the disciples right here are thinking. They are truly thinking like, this is it. This is the very end for us, but let's see what happens next in, in verse 38. 
It says that Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. I just love that, by the way, that like that Jesus was all man and all God. And the man part of him was like, I want a cushion for my cushion. And like he wanted to sit with a little bit of comfort. And here he was and he was fast asleep. And the disciples, they woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And let's see what Jesus says next here. It says that he got up, that Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and was completely calm. And then he said this to his disciples, and here's our question for today. I don't really care where you are, but say this with me. Why are you so afraid? Let's just ask that question again. Why are you so afraid? Guys, someone today needs to hear that this question is being asked to you wherever you're at, church online. This is us today. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid of everything that's happening around us? Like we've got Jesus. Okay, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit. So let's get back into the verse. Very next verse. Then he says, Jesus says, do you still have no faith. Now we're going to talk about that question a little bit more in week four. The disciples, um, they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And they began to see, this is Mark four. This is the first gospel written. This is the beginning of the story. And they're beginning to ask this question of, okay, who is this guy? Like we knew he could teach. We knew he could do some amazing stuff. But even the waves obey him. And so just what a cool perspective to kind of jump into. Now, I'm not a meteorologist. and I don't claim to be one. But, I, you know, I can do some research. And, and I've been to some classes. And the Sea of Galilee is about 680 feet below sea level. So it's kind of a unique body of water that sits really deep and surrounded by mountains. Now, kind of similar, kind of opposite. I've been to Lake Tahoe. It wasn't far from our church in California. And it's actually a really high elevation, but it's surrounded by mountains. And so all of a sudden, especially when you don't have like the AccuWeather app on your phone, is these storms can come out of nowhere because the mountains kind of cover your view. And it's just like that. All of a sudden, a bad storm can be on you. You know, and the same thing we actually can understand that if you're here in Florida is how quickly a bad storm can be upon you, you know, especially in the middle of the night. And, uh, and that can be really terrifying and, and scary. So all of a sudden, this storm was upon them. You know, maybe for you, you can experience this in another way. You know, you've actually had a time in your life where all of a sudden it's like things are going good. And you're just kind of going through the journey of life. You know, you're going to work, you're coming home, you're having that nice meal. You're getting a chance to spend time with the family you know, go to your kid's game and, and they're winning some games and kids' grades are good. And it's just like life is good. Then all of a sudden, a storm hits. All of a sudden, we had a hailstorm, what, just over a year ago here in Florida. And I was driving from Melbourne Beach over to Orlando to get some friends from the airport and to meet them over there. And I've got Preston and Angie and we're driving through the car and I'm, I'm actually getting ready to like pull off the the interchange there between 95 and 528. And so we're, we're going 60, we're slowing down, but all of a sudden it's like when the hail hit us, like I was like ducking cover. I thought we were getting shot at. And uh, because literally like we had a friend who had holes like destroy her glass with her kids in the car. And and we, we pulled around to get underneath the overchange because um, I had to get, my, my car got totaled, like legally totaled because of the hail just destroyed my car. And, uh, and it was all of a sudden, it was like a beautiful day. Then minutes later, it got cloudy. And then seconds later, it was like it went from no rain to hail everywhere. And maybe you've experienced that in your life. You know, all of a sudden, it's like you have this great sales quarter. And then you find out that you're getting laid off. You know, maybe you think that your marriage is better than ever. And you, you, a health complication comes in. You know, your, your child's on the right track. And then all of a sudden, one night changes everything and, and nothing else matters except for getting your child back on the track of of seeing them follow the lord and follow success and be able to, to live a healthy happy life sometimes people look on and say like man i wish i had a marriage like that person you know i can tell you as a pastor that i've had people make that comment to me about others 
um, and even to me about my life. And I'm like, man, if you only knew, like we're kind of going through a rougher time right now or other people who just act like they have it all together. And it's like, man, if I could just have that house with that pool and that grill and, and if I could just, you know, have that lifestyle and that family every single night who has all that stuff, they can't sleep because they're like, I don't know how we're going to pay for all this. You know, I thought we were going to be able to pay for this, but it's becoming more uh, and more difficult for us. You know, we fake it on the outside, but on the inside, like we're barely holding on by a thread. Sometimes you look on the outside and you see that everybody else looks good and you think you're the only one that's having trouble going to sleep at night, that you've cried yourself to sleep uh, more times than you would ever want to admit, that you feel more alone, that even the pressure of a lot of good things, a lot of good things, sometimes it just feels like way too much. I, I saw my wife today have like this moment of like burden being taken off of her because we're all on like this really long spring break with school being canceled an additional week after spring break and there's no soccer there's just no field trips like everything's just kind of changed uh she was going to sub that first week back quite a bit and she just took an eraser and like erased like 75 percent of our family schedule and I could just see that just kind of like, those are all good things, like things that we said yes to intentionally, but things that she kind of needed to just take some of that off. And so we can see that God kind of works in these things, you know, but all of a sudden things that you never see happening, sometimes good things and sometimes honestly, just really, really bad things. An interesting perspective um, that we always try to have when I worked in the children's hospital was a lot of the families that would come in, especially when you did an overnight and you were in the ER, that we came in knowing that we were going to be working at a children's hospital. I came in knowing I was going to be working trauma one, trauma two, and code blue. But pretty much every single family that we came in contact with, they woke up having no idea. Uh, I think of one circumstance that I actually had this conversation with a mom. Uh, she sent her son off to school. He was injured, so he couldn't participate actively with the track team. He was a, um, like a state finalist for shot putting, but his dad was a coach for the, the women's side, so he was actually coaching some of the females on their technique, and he went out to get a ball, but he was injured, like his shoulder or something, and he took the, the ball that you throw when you shot put is the shot. And... Um, one of the ones that was being thrown, it hit him right in the side of the head, right in the temple. And, you know, hours later, they were been med flighted and his skull was being opened up and, and just, she woke up thinking that her life was pretty normal. And hours later, her life was completely different. You know, the physical ones, I think it's easier for us to understand than some of the emotional relationship ones. But I've got two things I want to share with you to remember. Um, when you're in the storm, two things to embrace when you're in the storm. And uh, I wanted to say, if you're taking notes, um, I don't really have notes for this, but it's on the screen. If you want to write this down, uh, you're in the storm with his presence. I hope you know that this is actually good news, that if you are a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, that even when you're in the storm, that you can be in the presence of our good God. Now let's go look at some of the verses again and see how this is taking place. Verse 36 and 38 shows us that a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped or, or capsized. And it says in verse 38 that Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Don't forget, he's got his cushion. Jesus is doing good. So where was Jesus in the midst of this? He was in the stern. He was in the boat. And here's what happens so often. I believe a lot of people think, okay, wait a minute. If I'm with Jesus, you know, if I'm with Jesus, then there shouldn't be a storm. I gave my life to Christ. Therefore, it should be like smooth sailing for the rest of my life. And I need to tell you that that's just not true. And I apologize if you've heard another pastor, another pastor in an online environment who's told you that because it's simply not true. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world, that Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus never promised if you come to him that life will be easy, that it will be storm-free. In fact, the reality is often quite opposite. 
When you move from darkness to light, suddenly you step into the middle of this spiritual battle. You see, Christianity is not a playground. Christianity is a battlefield between the forces of darkness and light. When you step onto the side of light, suddenly darkness is against you when you're just doing nothing. I'm not saying you were on the side of darkness, but when you were just doing nothing in this spiritual battle, then there was no opposition. Now you face opposition. You face temptation. You face this spiritual battle. To think that just because I'm with Jesus, nothing should go wrong is a clear distortion of the life of Jesus, the life of the disciples, the life of the apostles, and the life that God has told us that we're going to live. You see, the truth is that God never ever promises that just because Jesus is on the boat, that the storm will never rock you. What he promises is the storm will never sink you. Now, I hope that makes sense. He never promises us that the storm will not come. But what he tells us is that when the storm comes, that we will have Jesus and that he will be with us. And we don't have to be so afraid uh, during this time of the storm. Because God is for you and God is with you and there is nothing that can take you out of the presence of God. It says in the Bible that we are in God's hand and nothing can take us out of God's hand. So we don't really need to fear life or death because we know that we are held by Jesus and that he holds on to us for all of eternity because Jesus was in the stern. He was on the boat and that's the total game changer is that Jesus was there. And that can be the game changer for your life, too, is if you have Jesus with you. What's really interesting is I read an article that talked about older people. That if older people have something alive in the house they have to take care of, that it, uh, it makes their life longer and happier. Now, this is good stuff. And so, you know, if you're, if you're older, there's a lot of, you know, fear going on right now with the health. So this might be important for you. You know, it can be absolutely anything. Now, they say a house plant, maybe a fern that you have to like water and take care of because a cactus for me doesn't seem like maybe that's going to work. But, you know, maybe you get a, a cute kitten. Maybe you get a little kitten, a big kitten. I've had really, really fat 28-pound kitten, cat. You know, maybe it's a goldfish. Um, maybe you get a ferret. In college, I had a ferret. Kind of smelly. They like to sleep where they poop, but at the same time, they're, they're very, very cute. Uh, we had a dwarf hamster. We really liked our dwarf hamster a lot. Uh, research says, I've not experienced this personally, but research says that there are certain kinds of dogs that some people tend to like. You know, if that's if that works for you, then, then, then God bless you on that. I th you know, but what I know is that older people live longer when there's something living inside their house. You know, every now and then, some of you, you're going to be in the middle of a storm. It's going to get really, really, really hard. And people are going to look and say, how are you getting through that? How are you enduring that? How are you being like this when your world is falling apart, but you're not falling apart? How come everything's going wrong and yet you still have this quiet confidence? Why is it that you're in the middle of the storm and yet you have this deep assurance? Why is it that you have this peace? In the middle of a storm i think there's a song out there that talks about that you know what you're going to be able to tell them is because i've got someone living in my house i'm not in this alone i've got someone that i can call on you see there's something in my house and he's not just alive it's the author of life it's the perfecter of life it's the it's the one who was the alpha and the omega you see his presence is with me that Jesus is in my boat, that Jesus is in my house. And because he is with me, I can sense his strength. I can sense his presence. I can sense his power and his comfort. Because Jesus is with me, he is in the boat with me. He is in my house. Jesus is in the storm with me. Just because I'm in a storm doesn't mean that he's not with me. I can handle the storm as long as I know that he is with me. When Jesus was on the cross, the only time that he seemed to be fearful was when he took on the sins of all mankind and he cried out, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Because through everything that he endured leading up to the cross, all the persecution, all of the beatings, all of the insults, all of the backs that were turned against him, he could do all of it. 
because he knew that he was in communion with God the Father. But when our sins went on to Jesus on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time we ever see Jesus seem somewhat fearful, even though he knew where this story was going to end. Does he never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God? See, I like to personalize scripture. I, I learned this when I became a chaplain is I would take scripture and I would print it off, you know, and I would give it to people with blanks and have them write their name in there. And so you can do that with Psalm 46, one and personalize it. God is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my ever present help in a time of trouble. He is with Kevin in the storm. He is with Angie in the storm. He is with put your name in the blank. He is with you in the storm. You know, do the same thing with Hebrew 13, 5. Never will my God leave me. Never will he forsake me. See, I love to personalize these things. God will never forsake Kevin. God will never forsake you. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you see, I'm not staying there, but we're walking through it. We're not going to just sit there because, because it says I will fear no evil. Why? Because my God is what? He is with me. He is with Kevin. He is with you. Put your name in there when you read that scripture and declare that that is absolutely true for you. He never, ever promised that the storm wouldn't rock you. He never promised you that the storm would be easy. But he did promise you that that storm does not have to sink you. You see, he's in my house. He's in my boat. I'm not alone in the middle of the storm. I pray that you find comfort no matter what you're going through, that you are in a storm with the presence of Jesus. The second thing, if you want to take some notes and write these down, is you're in this storm for his purposes. Now, this can be a harder one, but I just want to kind of talk about this today. Think about this. Jesus said this. I will get to that in a second. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Whose idea was it to go from the one side of the sea to the other? Well, the idea was Jesus. And I think Jesus knew exactly where he was going. Jesus was God in the flesh. And he knew on the east coast of the sea was a guy that was hurting because he was possessed with an evil spirit. And Jesus was taking the disciples to the other side, and Jesus was going to speak healing into this guy's life. Now, there's all kinds of different perspectives that we can look at this. That, you know, some have even said that, that as he was going to cast out this evil spirit, that the storm was a spiritual warfare of Satan trying to stop him from getting there. I don't know if Satan has that kind of power to do that. Others say that Jesus knew that the storm was going to happen. And he chose to go during this time to teach the disciples a lesson. Um, but regardless, we can see that it was Jesus' idea to go across this storm. And Jesus being God in the flesh knew that this whole thing was going to kind of take place. From that line of logic, we can say that they were not in a storm because they were out of God's will. The disciples were following Jesus' direction. They were going to do Jesus' ministry. They were completely in line with what Jesus wanted for them. And they were actually in the storm because they were in God's will. They weren't in the storm because they were out of God's will. They were in that storm because they were right in the middle of God's will. Now, some of you are going to get mad at me. And, uh, and now that I'm online, you guys can leave comments. And that's always great. You're going to say like, so what you're telling me is that God caused this storm, that God causes storms in life. And uh, I'm not really going to dig into that territory a lot, nor do I believe any human being really has the ability to 100% understand how God works in that realm. Um, but I will say this, that God in his sovereignty, sometimes we see in scripture that this is true. He allows storms to take place. I cannot tell you that God caused the storm. Or did God allow the storm? But I can tell you this, that God always uses a storm to do a work inside of us. Now I'm going to show you that verse from James. It says this in James, consider it pure joy. In other words, move to the state of worship which is in your soul, so you're full of joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whatever you face trials. 
whenever you face trials, you know, wait a minute, you see, that sounds ridiculous. You rejoice in the middle of the storms. You know, why would we do that? Why would we rejoice in the middle of the storm? And that's why James says this, let me look at verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Produces perseverance. You see, when you're in the middle of a test, why does a good teacher give tests? A good teacher will give you a test and not just, you know, have you show up to class every single day without a test. Because they want to pass you and they want to promote you, but they have to test you to actually know your knowledge and see what you've learned and to see how you can apply it. At the end of the year, you take a final exam and if you pass the test, you move on to a higher level. And God in his love may be allowing you to experience something, even a testing of your faith, promoting you to another level of belief. And this faith produces perseverance, something living inside of you. You can see here in verse 4, it says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The reality is in our church that we have a lot of people who are very, very young in their faith. And that's great. That's a the reason why we do church planning is to get people who have been unchurched into churches. So we have people that are not as mature um, as the language the, the Bible uses in their faith. In a lot of different ways, he matures us by getting us to know his word. He renews our mind. Um, he matures us as we discover our spiritual gifts and, and how we can make a difference, not just in our life, but we can make a difference in someone else's life. He matures us as we go through certain storms so that God does something in us. In fact, some of you, I would say the difference between where you are and where God ultimately wants you to be is the storm that you have yet to endure. Now, I don't say that because I look forward to a time for you to go through a storm, but I don't know how many of you know someone who's just like rock solid in your faith. Like I say that word, like rock solid in your faith, and you're like, Oh yeah, I know this couple. I know this person. I know this like 92 year old lady and she's like the most rock solid, strong person I've ever known in my life. Well, I can promise you they have been through some storms with Jesus because they know his faithfulness and they know his presence. They've learned that there is a purpose in every single storm, that God is often doing something in us and teaching us something in the middle of the storm that we couldn't learn in any other way. Did he cause it or did he allow it? I don't know. But I do know that he always uses it. The disciples had not yet gotten there, so they were panicking. See, they were they were only in Mark 4. They didn't know the rest of the story. They didn't know where the story was going to eventually end. In verse 39, um, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind. Now, I don't know what this looked like. Bad wind, you know, I'm not sure if he just yelled, bad, bad wind, you know, stop it, you know, take a time out, no more storm, you know, I don't know, but he rebukes the wind. He says to the winds, quiet, be still. And I feel like that's kind of cocky. Like, did he, he probably could have done it without saying anything. He could have done it just like quietly, like calm down, calm down. But he rebuked the wind. He like yelled, quiet, be still. There's an exclamation point in, the, in our scripture that we can see. You know, he, he did this with emphasis. And, uh, and the wind dies down and it's completely calm. Then Jesus took his disciples and asked them this question. Why are you so afraid? Don't you remember that I opened the eyes of the blind? That I healed deaf ears? Don't you remember I'm the author of life? And that I am with you. And then it continues this in verse 40. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. You see, what I, what I love about this is in the beginning of this, they refer to him as teacher. They say, teacher, teacher, do you care if we drown? teacher teacher from this point on in the rest of the text of mark they call him lord you see this was the turning point for them they went into the storm knowing that he was a great teacher they left this storm 
knowing that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was Lord and that he was God in the flesh. And maybe that's what a storm is going to have to happen for you to realize who God is. See, the fear of the storm started to grow this holy fear inside of them. The fear of what happened to them transferred them into a holy, awe-filled fear of the Lord. So a lot of you right now, you're in a storm. If you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask you, why are you afraid? Have you forgotten that when you're in the storm, that you have the presence of God with you, that he is for you, that he is with you, that he is working in all things to bring about good to those who love him or are called according to his purpose, that you're in the storm with his presence and you're in the storm for his purpose. You're in the storm with his presence and you're in the storm for his purpose. So why are you afraid? Why are we so afraid these days? And as you get to know him and Jesus matures you as you grow through some storms, you endure some storms with him, and suddenly here's what happens. In the middle of the storm, you can be afraid because the boat looks like it's going to sink, but suddenly your hope is no longer in the boat, but your soul is anchored in the Lord, and that changes everything. My hope no longer is in the boat. You see, my soul is anchored in the Lord because he is my boat. He is in my house. He dwells within me. He is with me. He is for me, and therefore he has not given me a spirit of fear, the Bible says, but a power of love and of a sound mind. So why are you afraid when Jesus is with you and you're in the boat? I'm going to pray and then ask a little bit more some questions and see what God wants to do with us today. Father, we pray that in your presence, God, that you would do a healing work. And especially, God, for those who are enduring maybe even a more severe storm than anything that we've even talked about. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts that only you can do. Now, if you're with me online, if you would just take a moment, just reflect in prayer. I want to take a moment and just pray for those of you that would say, I'm in the middle of a storm. And maybe somebody that I love is in the middle of a storm right now and needs a touch of God in the middle of a storm. If that's you and you feel like you're hurting, you feel like right now your life is just stuck in the middle of a storm, um, I just want to take a moment and just bring you before the counselor. We have the Holy Spirit with us that Jesus refers to as the counselor who is going to come and be with us. But Jesus asks us this question. Why are you so afraid? If that's you, and you hear this message and you say, but Kevin, I'm still afraid. Let me pray with you right now. God, I hurt with those who are hurting today. And I know, God, that you hurt even more. But I'm so thankful, God, that in your sovereign love, that you know the details of every situation. And God, not only do I pray that you would calm the storm as you often can, but God, even if you don't calm a storm, I pray that your divine presence would minister peace. A peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand. God, I pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would bring a comfort that only you can bring. And God, in your presence, I pray that we could start to even sense a purpose. That you're doing something in us. That you're teaching us something that we couldn't learn in any other way. God, in the presence of your Son, Jesus, there is hope, even in the middle of the worst storm. God, help us to cling to Jesus, cling to him, believe that he is enough. And God, I pray for miracles. That the storms would pass quickly, that there would be healing, wholeness, forgiveness, restoration, God, that the storms would be still, but even more so, that we would know the everlasting presence and glory of your son, Jesus. Amen. Now, some of you right now, we're almost done. But let me be real honest. You're in a storm, and it's really hard for you because you are not with Jesus. If you are trying to go through life without Jesus with you, 
that's a hard storm to go through. There are so many questions I have, but I do know that sometimes I believe that God will allow us to get so low that we have nowhere else to look but up and to call on him. I've been there myself and I've been there with others. Because when there is no storm, sometimes we don't feel a deep need for him. But in the middle of the storm, you realize you need divine help. I also know there's some of you who you feel like you've been going through this storm for so long that you're actually questioning if he's even there for you. Some of you right now, you recognize that you need him. The reality is whether you're in a storm or not, we all need him because our sinfulness separates us from this holy God. But in his love and in his mercy, our God is so good. It's called the gospel. It's the good news that God came, that God came for every single one of us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who was born without sin, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross for a death that he didn't deserve, but we did, and was raised again so that anyone who calls upon his name shall be saved. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, how bad your storm is, when you call on the name of Jesus, he will forgive every sin. He'll dwell within you, and he'll be in your house forever, and someday we'll go to live with him in his house for all of eternity. You'll find the comfort and the power of his presence and the Holy Spirit, and you will never be alone again. Jesus promises that he must leave so that an even better one may come, that the Counselor and the Holy Spirit, that God's Spirit, can come and dwell inside of us. For those of you that recognize that you need his grace, that you need his forgiveness, and today, by faith, we're going to turn from our sin, and we're going to turn towards him and say, Jesus, I call on you. Would you be my savior? My hope is not in the boat. Today, I put my faith, my hope, and my life in you. If that's with you, if that is you, would you pray with me? Pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive us our sins. Make us brand new. Jesus, we believe that you died for us that you rose again so that we could live for you. Thank you for new life. Thank you for giving us your life so that we could live in eternity with you. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your comforter. Fill us with your counselor so that we can serve you, follow you, and live for you. Our life is not our own. Today we give it to you because you have already given us yours. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, church. We are going to do three more weeks of this, but um, I would love to connect with you. Um, if you want to reach out to con contact us through our, our Facebook page or through the YouTube, you can comment. Um, I will go through any comment and reply to them this week. And then next week, we are going to go into part two and continue to ask these powerful questions that can dig into what God is doing in our lives in a more powerful way. If uh, you are part of our community, um, and I say community, not just Rock Harbor Church, but the Melbourne Beach um, and greater area of Melbourne and in this beachside community of Space Coast, and during this time of um, this coronavirus, if you have any kind of need that as a church that we can help meet, uh, also reach out to us, um, and we will do everything we can to love and serve you because Jesus has called us to bless our community and we will do that every single day. So we love you. God loves you and God bless.